the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. We'll read chapter 2. We'll read from verses 1 through 16. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. We'll read responsively. Verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. But we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Just as you know, how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children. Then ye would walk worthy of God, which had called you unto his kingdom and glory. And for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is the word of God which also performs its work in you who believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God in Judea are in Christ Jesus. He also have suffered like things among your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, they are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. Okay, let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this evening we come before your word once again. Lord, we thank you for these uh, statements that are in your word. Lord, this evening as we meditate on your word, as we consider the truths of your word, we pray that you would uh, visit us, you would speak to us, you would stir our hearts to please you. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Please speak to us. Please energize, vitalize our spiritual lives. Please uh, exhort us. Please stimulate us so that we may please you in every way. Lord, please give us grace. Father, this evening, I commit myself to you. I pray that you would help me to speak plainly to your children, that we would 
receive uh, the truths of your word. I pray that you'd give me wisdom, Lord. Give me the thought process. I commit myself to you. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. As Christian people, our desire must be to please God. We must desire to please God. One of the things we can do in our desire to please the Lord is to learn about godly men who please the Lord. One of the things we could do if we want to please the Lord is to learn about godly men, the men who went before us. How they please the Lord. By studying these godly men, we can learn some truths and we can apply these truths to our own lives to please the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, there are certain truths about the Apostle Paul. It is a, there are a number of passages that talk about Paul the person, Paul the individual, Paul who he is as a person. There are a number of passages in scripture that talk about Paul the person. What is his character portrayed? In 1 Thessalonians 2, there is a portrait of Paul the person, who he is. We know Paul is one of the mightiest men God has used. Getting into the portrait of Paul and trying to understand his character, learning certain things about him, can help us to please the Lord. And I want to um, bring forward four truths which are in this portion. This uh, message has been, uh, uh, if, you, if you will, there's a big impact on this message by a preacher by the name John Stark. Um, I had, years ago, I've studied First Thessalonians. Uh, I've used his commentary extensively. And the message that you're going to get is a dil very diluted version of John Stott's commentary on First Thessalonians. In first chapter, Paul says a couple of things about this church, about Thessalonica. Uh, in Thessalonica. He says in verse 8, he says, the word of the Lord, meaning the gospel, sounded forth from you. In other words, the gospel became a sounding board. The gospel came to you and the gospel did not stop in your church. It became a sounding board. It became resonant. It did not contain itself to your local church, but it sounded forth from you into Macedonia, into Achaia. So in other words, they not only received the gospel, but they transmitted the gospel. It was not contained in their local church, but it went into Achaia, which is the southern part. It went to Macedonia, which is the northern part. So through this church, the gospel transmitted. The kingdom of God advanced. Not only that the gospel transmitted through this church, Paul also says in verses 9 and 10, this particular church truly embraced the gospel, truly embodied the gospel, tr 
truly was transformed by the gospel. When the gospel came to them, there was a change in life. We studied it extensively. There is a change in life. There is a U-turn. There is a new creation. They did the most astonishing thing that could ever be done. You know what they did? They burned down all the idols of the past life. They turned away from idols. They thought these are man-made, these are, this is false religion. They burned it down. That's the most astonishing thing you could do even today. Not only that, not only they were receivers, transmitters of the gospel, not only did they embody the gospel, but they also suffered extensively for the gospel. We read that in verse four, uh, chapter 2, verse 14. In this, he brings it in chapter 2, verse 14. He says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. So Paul is comparing this church, this Thessalonican church, to the Judean church. In Jerusalem there was a church, around, in the territory of Judea, there were churches. All these early churches were persecuted. They were looked down upon because they thought they were uh, compromising Judaism. And the Jews persecuted this early uh, Jewish churches, if you will. And Paul is saying, you also endured great suffering, great affliction from, from your countrymen, from your own people. They were put out of their communities. They lost their jobs. They lost their livelihood. Some of them were brought before courts for, um, for renouncing the idols. We see these three things happening. This is a true church. You are not only called to believe on the gospel, we read in Philippians 1, we read, in verse 29 we read, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So the dual calling, the sign of maturity in a church, all the signs of maturity, not only believing, but to actually suffer for the gospel's sake is evident in this, in this church. Being transmitters of the gospel, embodying the gospel, turning from idols to serve the living and true and holy God and waiting for his son from heaven and also suffering for the gospel's sake. A good testimony, a great testimony. But what is the greatest impact? How did this church get there? What is the greatest impact in their lives? What was the greatest influence in their lives? We, we know, we've remembered many times so far that Paul only spent three weeks here in this church. What is the greatest impact in this church? They were impacted so much by the life of the Apostle Paul himself that they only, if you will, imitated, verse 6 says, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 says, you become imitators of us. You became copies of us. So whatever they seen in Paul, they copied Paul and so they became very effective in their testimony. 
the gospel sounded forth from them. They had a true conversion experience. They suffered for the gospel's sake. They learned this by just observing Paul. This uh, evening, if we learn these observations from the apostle Paul's life, we also can have a good testimony like this church. We also can please the Lord. In fact, these words are very simple for us to remember and we are going to get these words from, from these, uh, from these uh, 16 verses. They picked up a few principles from the Apostle Paul. They applied it. They were able to please the Lord. The first principle Chapter 2 verse 4, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Paul saying, I have been entrusted, I have been committed this gospel. I have been approved by God. God commissioned me, God called me and he gave me this gospel. In other words, we can use a word to describe what's going on here. The word is, we are stewards of the gospel. God has, it is not his message. It is not his idea. It is not his philosophy. He is a receiver. He is a steward of the message of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and, and stewards of the mysteries of God. He is a steward. He is a manager of the mysteries of God. He doesn't own this. It is given to him. Galatians 1, Galatians 1, verse 12, actually let's read verse 11 and 12, Paul saying this, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. In other words, he's saying, you know the gospel I preach? It did not originate in man. It is not man's idea. For I neither received from man, nor I was taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, I got it directly from Christ Jesus. From the ascended Son of God, I got this. This is not earthly bound. This is a message from heaven. And I have been committed this message. I am a steward for this message. Paul was continuously cautious of this. This message is from heaven it doesn't have man's origin it is not a new age teaching it is a teaching directly it is a message directly from heaven paul was continuously cognizant of this fact he was continuously aware of this fact the origin of this gospel message is from heaven itself In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, maybe he, he was not explicit in saying this, but implicit was, was in, in his behavior that this message is from heaven. That while he was preaching, the people picked it up. 1 Thessalonians 2 13. For this reason, we constantly thank God. Paul is saying, I'm giving thanks to God on behalf of you. Why? That when you received from us the word of God, 
you accepted it not as the word of men but for what it is really it is the word of god which also performs its work in you who believe the thessalonian believers when the apostles preached to them they knew it was not the word of men it was the word of god its origin is from heaven they accepted it as it really is that is the word of god they saw paul only as a steward as a manager the owner of this message is god himself the owner is god himself and it, this message this gospel message this salvation message that by repenting and believing in jesus christ we have eternal salvation we have forgiveness of sins we have eternal life this message is from heaven they saw in paul a steward now a steward is one who is faithful isn't it he doesn't own it and this stewardship has been if you will translate it in the life of their church now they have become stewards like paul they saw this ma- message is from heaven they must be faithful to this message and what did they do they not only they did not contain it to their local church but they became a sounding board they sounded forth the gospel in the surrounding areas in Mace- uh, in macedonia and achaia steward steward if you and i are to be pleasing to the lord we must be faithful stewards we've been entrusted with this message we are not to hold it in ourselves but like this church we are to evangelize like paul we are to evangelize we have to share this message the gospel must sound forth from us paul says elsewhere we have this treasure in earthen vessels second corinthians 5:7 4:7 second corinthians 4:7 we have this treasure in earthen vessels what is the treasure the gospel we must share this treasure this valuable thing this is the only hope for mankind this is the only hope for people lost in this world we must be faithful stewards second timothy 22 what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who would be able to teach others also paul is commissioning timothy and saying in second timothy 22 and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also we must desire to be these faithful men who will teach the gospel to others also this is the only message that can make man right with god so the thessalonians embrace this principle paul a faithful steward they were faithful stewards they speak to us 2000 years later and say ask us the question are you a faithful steward of this message are you a faithful manager of this message or only are you just a container of this message may god give us grace that we would be faithful stewards in transmitting and passing on this message of salvation The second thing we see in Paul, about Paul in this chapter 
is in verse 7. He gives a word to describe himself. If you and I are to please the Lord, this has to be in increasing measure in our lives. He says in verse 7, We proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Did you pick up the word? How many of you pick up the word? Paul's calling himself what? Nursing mother. Nursing mother. Mother or nursing mother? Mother or nursing mother? Okay, what's the difference? The difference is, a nursing mother is a mother who is a new mother, right? She just gave birth to a child and she's weaning the child, right? She's weaning the child. A nursing mother is known for some attributes. What are those attributes? How many hours a nursing mother sleeps, especially early on? Any answers? Continuous sleep. Two hours. <laughs> yeah. We can say four hours, right? It involves a lot of Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice of sleep. Not only sacrifice of sleep, but there involves this gentleness in attending to the child. There is this gentleness attending to the child. I was uh, listening to a conversion story and this man goes on to show, uh, tell his depravity, right? His, his utter stupidity. He goes on to speak of his uh, child who was just born and the child was uh, weeping, weeping in the night. He was so depraved, in other words, he was so into sin that when this little one began to weep, he took the baby, literally spanked the baby. And he was saying, this was my depravity. By the grace of God, I've been converted. In other words, he was being brash. He was being rash to this just born baby. Paul, when he is identifying serving God, he's saying, I'm like a nursing mother. I am gentle. I am sacrificial. I am patient. Elsewhere, in, he goes on to say something very similar. Turn to um, uh, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, he goes on to say this. Verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility, Acts chapter 20, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Paul, wherever he went, he was persecuted. Amidst the persecution, amidst the Jewish tri trials or plots to kill him, how did he serve the Lord? He served the Lord with tears, with sacrifice. If you and I are to serve the Lord, having the picture of a nursing mother is very important. It is very, very important. If you want to will, uh, win souls 
for Christ. This picture of a nursing mother is very important. We have to be very gentle, we have to be very patient. We must be willing to listen all the nonsense people want to talk. First, uh, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two. Paul's telling Timothy, "You want to be a man of God. You want to please God. You must learn this, Timothy." Sorry, verse 24. Verse 24. But the Lord's born servant must not be, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. Patient when wronged. Verse 25. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading, to, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Patient, patience, gentleness, a nursing mother known for patience and gentleness. You and I, if we are to please the Lord, these Attributes must, um, must accompany us and they are given to us by the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. They come, they are the fruit of the Spirit. The more we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's guidance, that's when they be can become ours. So Paul is saying, Paul sees himself in 1 Thessalonians. We looked at two pictures he has given us, right? First one is faithful steward. The second picture he is giving is, he has become like a nursing mother. Patient and gentle, working with them explaining to them the gospel, explaining to them the scriptures, reasoning to them from the scriptures, patiently and gently. There was so much opposition from the Jewish people, but he would work with them so patiently, gently, as a nursing mother, he would deal with them. Faithful stewards, nursing mother. There is a third word he uses to describe his ministry. Verse 11. <clears throat> Let's read from verse 10. We'll read verse 11, both 10 and 11. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we have behaved toward you believers. Verse 11. Just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. As a father would his own children. If you and I are to please the Lord, Paul's saying, we must become in God's work, spiritual fathers to other people. Spiritual fathers, not physical fathers, it's impossible. Spiritual fathers. What does a father do? Inevitably, if you notice in natural life, there's a saying in Telugu. It means, as father, as, as son, as father, as son. So the son would become a copy of the father. Paul saying, we, uh, when we were with you, when we were with you for those three weeks, you remember how we were with you? We set an example to you. We devoutly 
and uprightly and blamelessly. We were devout, we were blameless, we were upright. You know, when we were with you, verse 9 says, You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship. You know, we came to you. We were apostles. We deserve to be taken care of by you. The worker is worth his wages. We served among you. We deserve wages for our work among you. Paul saying, You recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day, so as to not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. But we didn't want to be a burden to you. We deserve to be taken care of by you. We deserve our wages from you. But we did not take any of that. We labored. We behaved uprightly. We behaved righteously. We behaved devoutly. We didn't go after your money. There are a lot of people who want money. But to distinguish ourselves from false preachers, we did not expect anything from you. We labored day and night among you. There are many today that serve the Lord. I, I, I shouldn't use the word, serve the Lord. There are many today in so-called Christendom, in Christian ministry, that are only for the money. How dreadful it would be for such men. The scripture calls them, their God is their belly, is their stomach. There are many, many. Paul saying, you know, we are not like that. We set godly example. We are like a father to a child. We are like a father to... to to a child. We set godly example. If you and I are to please the Lord, people should see a godly example, a godly model in our lives. Our children should see a godly model, a godly example in our lives. In verse 11, he goes on to say, not only we set a godly example, we were righteous, we were devout, we were upright. He goes on to say, How we were exhorting you and encouraging you and imploring you. Each one of you as a father would his own children. The father's role is to exhort is to encourage. The father's role is to exhort, encourage, implore his sons to walk in the right way. Unfortunately, we have many fathers who are constant critics of their children. Never a word of praise, never a word of acknowledgement, only critiquing, 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 destroying the child. Paul saying, you know, I'm not like that. I'm a, I was like a father exhorting you, encouraging you, imploring you to do the right thing. Paul is saying, I'm setting a godly example. And I'm teaching you, in other words, teaching you constantly to do the right thing, to please the Lord. That was the way I lived amidst you. This evening, if you are to please the Lord, we must be not only a faithful steward, not only a nursing mother to souls, 
but we must be an encouraging father to souls an encouraging father encouraging people in the lord to grow in the lord to commit their life to the lord to do the right thing to please the lord the last one in verse 13 if you and i are to please the lord we must be heralds heralds of the gospel of god in verse 13 we see paul saying We thank God that you received the message from us, the word of God from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it is, the word of God. You and I, a herald, Paul went to this church, he heralded. He preached, uh, we use in English, we use the word preacher, right? A preacher is one who preaches the word. Herald is one who announces the word. Um, preacher has a different connotation. It involves pastoral, military, etc. But the idea here is a herald. A herald is one who goes before and he announces the coming of a great dignitary. The, he announces the, the coming of a great person. You know, John the Baptist, what is he called? He is the forerunner. He is the herald. Herald of what? Herald of the coming Messiah. He announced the coming of the Son of God. You and I, if you have to please the Lord, well known verse, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, right? What is the, what is the exact verse? Romans, Romans 10. Oh, 15, thank you. We read that verse there. And how shall they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. You and I are to be heralds. Heralds of whom? Heralds of Christ. There's so much Christianity today that is rooted in moralism. We tell all the biblical biblical concepts but we don't tell the strength be behind those biblical concepts the foundation behind those biblical concepts in other words we remove Christ and teach a certain moralism Paul was not like that in 1st Corinthians uh, 2 he says 1st Corinthians 2 2 1st Corinthians 2 2 he says Why do men and women remove Christ and give this uh, moral teaching? Because they want to please God. Oh, sorry, they want to please people. Unlike them, Paul is saying, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Verse 4, And my message and my preaching was not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of, the, and of power, that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Paul saying, I'm an announcer of Christ. I totally rely on the spirit. Christ is my message. The greatest temptation in this age is to remove Christ. We don't want Christ, but we want 
a certain moral teaching. We cannot be true heralds if we remove Christ. We are to announce the person of Christ, the work of Christ, what he does in our lives. This early church, this Thessalonian church did that. They went to Achaia, they went to Macedonia. They declared what? The person of Christ, the work of Christ. They were heralds. Where did they get it from? They copied the apostle Paul. This morning, this evening, if you and I are to please the Lord, these four word pictures before us, faithful stewards of the mysteries of God, a nursing mother, an encouraging father, teaching the ways of God to other souls. Lastly, the announcers of, or the heralds of Christ in this last world. These images must be before us. That is our role in this world. Let us pray that God would give us grace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship thee, we praise thee. Lord, we thank you for the autobiographical statements inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us, Lord, um, to give us a view, to give us a looking into the person of Paul, the great apostle. Father, we have uh, in weakness studied these things. Father, unless you water them, the weak seed will die. Lord, we pray that you would water it with your spirit, that these four word pictures would be in front of our eyes. Lord, we pray that you would make us faithful stewards, help us to be faithful in everything you give us, our time, our money, our gifts, Lord, our talents, Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to use them for the spread, for the expansion of your kingdom. Lord, help us to be a church like the Thessalonian church. Father, we also pray that you would, by your spirit, Lord, give us the fruit of the spirit. Lord, help us, Lord, that we would gently nurture souls, Lord, that they may enter into the kingdom of God. Father, we pray that as we deal with one another in the church life, that we would be encouraging fathers to each other. Please give us grace, Lord. Father, we also pray that you would make us announcers, heralds of this good news wherever we go. Lord, give us a burden for the lost. Please help us, Lord. Help us to announce the, the great King, Christ Jesus. Please give us grace. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen.